Good morning. Uh, before we begin, I need to mention that, that this event is being recorded. Um, so uh, please respect our safe space. Thank you very much. My name is Lisa Simons and I'm the secretary of the Fairville Diversity Coalition Board. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the eighth annual Martin Luther King Jr. Virtual Breakfast. I've been on the Fairville Diversity Coalition Board for several years and was part of the Fairville community for 19 years before moving to the country 20 miles west this past fall. Don't worry, I still return to Fairville often. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Fairbow Foods, Jenny O, and Excel Energy, and South Central College. Their support of FDC programming makes events like these possible. We'd also like to thank the Fairbow Elks Lodge. They were willing to host us had we been in person. Um, Peter, if you could please switch. Uh, before we begin, um, I wanted to take a moment and pay a tribute uh, to one of our board members. Uh, Jessica Thomas um, passed away this past September at the age of 33. And as our former uh, board member, Kent Fries wrote, she was a quiet and unassuming person, but she also cared deeply about the people in her community. In her work with the FDC, she strove to make Faribault a better and more welcoming place for everyone, and in particular, those in the margins. The world lost a good one yesterday. The FDC purchased a tree that was planted in Idaho in her memory. So we'd like to thank Jessica, um, and uh, we do miss her. Thank you, Peter. Um, Next, uh, we asked the students at all the Faribault K-12 public, private, and charter schools to enter a writing contest. And we'd like to thank Mrs. Little, Mrs. Dietz and Mrs. Fault at Roosevelt, Mrs. Lindsay at Jefferson, Mrs. Nehmeyer at STEM, and Ms. Swaggerman at the Faribault Middle School for their student submissions. The judges had a very difficult time deciding, but the... These are the winners. For grades three through five, first place is Reese Bolster. Second place is Dorian Perez. Third place is Isaiah Bell. And because we just couldn't narrow it down to three, our two honorable mentions are Maylee Thibodeau, and Allison Kramer. So can you do a little applause for those third through fifth place winners? So excited. We were they were just so happy with what they did for, um, uh, it was in your own words, tell about um, what Martin Luther King's dream means to you. Um, for grades six through eight, we have first place is Daniel Pimental de Villa. And second place is Katie Andrade Martinez. So again, applause for these winners. So all of these writers receive cash prizes and a Faribault Diversity Coalition t-shirt, which I am wearing today. So very exciting. So thank you so much again for all of these submissions. It was very, very challenging for the judges to, uh, to come up with um, those, um, those winners. So um, let's see, we are uh, running a little bit early, but I hope that all of our um, uh, prayer speakers are here with us today. I'd like to introduce uh, First Pastor Cherry Chatelaine from First English Lutheran Church. She will be followed by Faribault resident Rosie Tobar, and then Bashir Omar from the Abu Bakr As Sadiq Islamic Center, and they'll be sharing prayers with us before we begin our pro our program. Well, good morning. Thank you for having me here. I am honored and humbled to be joining you here today. And on behalf of everyone at First English, um, thank you for being here and for being a partner in our community and for the work that you do. Um, I am excited to be here to listen and learn and, um, and to grow. So as we begin, let us pray. Good and gracious God, 
thank you for this day, for crisp, cold air that reminds us that we're alive, for the warmth of indoors and the warmth that we find in our community, and for this time together. We thank you for Martin Luther King Jr. and the impact that he had on this world. Thank you for his strength and his perseverance and what he did for justice and for equity. Inspire us with your Holy Spirit as you inspired him to do your work in this world. Give us strength and courage to fight for justice, mercy, and compassion to hear one another's truths and forgiveness and understanding to find a way to be united as your people. Help us to see the differences in one another as strengths for this whole community on earth. Help us to see you in all those around us. Help us to see how far we have come in the work of reconciliation and to hear the challenging words that show us how far we have yet to go. Help us to see the broken systems in our world and guide us in breaking them down and creating a new system that brings equity and shows your love to all. Open our hearts to learn and change and grow. Open us to your call to be your people in this world, to hear the cries of the oppressed, to break chains, and to be bearers of hope. Bless this day. Keep us safe. Keep the memory of Martin Luther King Jr. and others like him and the work that they did alive in our hearts and in our minds and help us to show your presence, your love, and your justice in this world. All these things we pray in your holy name. Amen. Thank you so much. Faribault resident Rosie Tobar. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start praying uh, with the Bible reading of Psalm 117. Alabada Jehová, naciones todas, pueblos todos, alabadle, porque ha engrandecido sobre nosotros su misericordia, y la fidelidad de Jehová es para siempre. Amén. Oh, praise the Lord, all your nations. Praise him, all you people, for his merciful kindness is great towards us, and the trust of the Lord endure for every praise yet the Lord. Gracias, Señor, en esta mañana venimos delante de ti, dándote gracias por este evento que se está llevando. Thank you, God. We are gathered this morning uh, to do this event, to remember Master Luther King Jr., para recordar al Señor Martin Luther Jr. Te pedimos, Señor, que tu presencia, que tu Espíritu Santo esté en medio de nosotros, I ask you, Father, that your presence and that the Holy Spirit is here with us this morning para que podamos, Señor, seguir adelante luchando por una realidad, Señor, por una igualdad humana so we can continue now in this time to continue to um, pray for an equal opportunity regardless of the color of the skin and that's what uh, Martin Luther King showed us, because you see all of us are like our creator. We all are your children, your human beings. And that's why we are here today to remember such a wonderful um, leader at the time when he was um, killed. Venimos delante de ti, Señor, para pedir una unidad humana de igualdad, Señor, Así como Señor Martín Lutero, Padre, se pudo, Señor Eterno, pelear para una igualdad entre los seres humanos, Señor, que ahora en este tiempo continuemos haciendo lo mismo. Let us all continue to, to fight or to do things so we can all be equal, especially in Fairbow, where there is a, a lot of people from different countries but we are all humans. That's what we continue to believe as part of the Fairbow Diversity Coalition. Es lo que continuamos creyendo que podemos hacer la diferencia, Señor, en Fairbow, Padre. Te doy gracias, Señor, por esta oportunidad. En el nombre de Jesús, amén. I thank you, God, for the opportunity. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Muchas gracias, Rosie.
Um, de nada. Uh, and now, uh, Bashir Omar. Hi, everyone. Good morning. And thank you so much for inviting us um, to this event um, to be part of the MLK um, event. So um, we, are so, we are so thankful and to be part of, uh, of um, partner, partners with uh, Federal Diversity. And I will start the prayers in, in Arabic and I will translate into English. Uh, there are the verses I will read is from the Quran. I will read it in, 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 in Arabic first. يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير <coughs> O mankind indeed we have created you from male and female and made you people and tribes that you may know one another Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Indeed, Allah is knowing and acquainted. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful, praise be to Allah, the Lord of the world, the most gracious, the most merciful, master of the day of judgment. It's you we worship and upon you we call for help. Guide us to the straight path and the path of those you have blessed not those who are against to whom there is an anger, and, note, and not those who are misguided. Inna fi khalq al-samawati wal-ardi wa ikhtilaf al-layli wal-nahari la ayatin li'unil al-baab. Indeed, the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alternation of the night and the day are signs for those of understanding. الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار and who remember Allah while standing or sitting or laying on their sides and give thoughts to the creation of the heavens and the earth our Lord, you did not create this aimlessly. Exalted are you above such a thing. Then protect us from the punishment of the fire. Rabbana innaka man tudkhil innara faqada khzayta wa ma lidhalimina min ansar. Our Lord, indeed, whom, whoever you admit to the fire, you have disgraced him. And for the wrongdoers, are th there are no helpers. ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا Our Lord, indeed, we have heard a caller calling to faith, saying, believe in your Lord. And we have believed. ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار Our Lord, so forgive us our sins and remove from us our misdeeds and cause us to die with the righteous. ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسولك ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد our Lord, and grant us what you promised us through your messenger, and do not disgrace us on the day of destruction. Indeed, you do not fail in your promises. Amen. Amen. Mahatsanid. Thank you to everyone. Really appreciate your time. Um, now I'd like to introduce uh, Mustafa Abdile the Jenny O HR manager. Good morning. Uh, hope you guys can all hear me. Um, I'm Mustafa Abdili. I'm the HR manager here at the Jenny O Turkey Store plant here in Fairbolt. So really honored to be here today. Thank you for, to everybody who's here. Beautiful prayers by, uh, by everyone. Just wanted to talk to you guys about Jenny O, just a little bit of history. 
Uh, Genio Foods started in the 40s by Earl B. Olson, uh, who actually named it after his daughter, Jenny. That's what that, where that name comes from. Um, <laughs> purchased his first plant right around the 50s in Wilmer, and Hormel ended up acquiring that company back in the 80s. Um, the Genio, the turkey store company, started in the 20s in Barron um, by Wallace Jerome. That's where that Jerome Foods uh, comes from. And in 2001, um, Hormel acquired Jerome Foods as well and uh, merged the two companies and created a fancy name, Jenny O. Turkey Store. And that's what everybody's kind of familiar with now. Um, <coughs> excuse me, Jenny O. Um, Jenny o employs about 7,000 employees uh, throughout Minnesota and, uh, and Wisconsin. Uh, company operates about nine processing plants, uh, boning value-added processing, about 140. Actually, it's closer to 160 now. Um, breeder farms, eight mills, and, and four hatcheries. Uh, this plant has been here since the 50s. And uh, just want to thank everybody on behalf of the plant manager, myself, and every employee here at the company for, for allowing us to be part of this uh, great um, celebration and 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 remembers remembrance of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, up next, I just wanted to take a few minutes to introduce our speaker, Isabel Monk O'Connor. Uh, Isabel is an outstanding actress in film and and on stage, including Broadway, the Guthrie, and the Kennedy Center, with uh, several honors and awards. She's also an author of several children's books. Um, Isabel holds a degree from. Tucson State University, Yale, Saint, and St. Thomas University. She volunteers her time in creative storytelling, public school residency programs, and the president, and as the president of the Board of Buckham West, Fairbolt Senior Center, and is a Blandon Community Leadership uh, Fairbolt alumni. So I wanted to welcome uh, Isabel O'Connor. Thank you guys for having us. Well, thank you very much. Wow. Uh, I have just greatly appreciated those who spoke before me. I also appreciate those who came before me. Those people in my personal family and those people in my family of folks who were brought here from far away. I was born in Washington, D.C., in 1952 at DC General Hospital, which was at that time a colored hospital. Um, be, and it was about 30 miles north of where I uh, grew up in Maryland. My mother and father who were teenagers, were teenage parents. <laughs> Um, uh, my father, um, my, my father was illiterate and my mother was illiterate, which means she chose to not to really read. I did find some true confession magazines under her pillow a couple of times, but that is as far as it went. Oh, and the TV guide, of course. I, I, um, was introduced to the ABCs and the um, and arithmetic when I um, went to um, Pamunkey, Pamunkey, which is the name of an Indian tribe which settled in that part of Maryland, Pamunkey Elementary School. Um, I then went to Pamunkey Junior High School, which wasn't, it, I guess it's the equivalent of what one calls middle school nowadays. And I had the, um, the privilege and, um, <laughs> and not privilege, I guess, of graduating in 1970 from Lackey High School. Lackey, can you believe it? But that was named after a commander, Lackey, who um, had been at the ordnance station which was not very far from where I grew up. Uh, and it was a forced 
integration in 1968. And it was not pretty. It was ugly. There were people in trucks and guns and stuff and threatening us. <laughs> it was a mess. But um, it took about six months for people to calm down and realize things have to change. And change is inevitable. Just watch the sun go from rising to setting. Just watch the seasons change. So I graduated from Lackey High School and was um, offered and accepted a full scholarship to a white teacher's college in Towson, Maryland, which is right outside of Baltimore. Uh, the uh, historically black college that was seven miles away from it was Morgan State College. And my mother just said, you're going to Towson because I don't have to pay money. So anyway, I graduated in 74 with a bachelor degree uh, in English and theater. And it is in theater that I felt that I felt the most comfortable because I didn't have to be myself. I could be anybody. I could be anything I wanted to be. And um, so I, I did, I completed my scholarship, which caveat was that I had to teach for two years in the state of Maryland. I took a year off and joined a traveling theater company. And then uh, after that, I went to uh, teach as a, for two years as a roving um, teacher of, um, of, of students who did not speak English, speakers of other languages is what they called it. And then I, uh, um, I still had this theater bug, and I, I, but in, but I really, really, really loved Shakespeare, and I asked myself, what, what can I do? And I decided to, um, I decided to um, put throw my hat and at the Yale School of Drama, and I, and I was not accepted. And I, so I worked as a receptionist and all kinds of stuff like that. And then I said, I, I just can't, I, I'm going to do it again. And I did. I applied again. And the day that I was going up there for my uh, final uh, meeting, it snowed like a foot and a half. And I was the only person that made it to my audition. And I think that's why they felt like, well, she can do this. Well, maybe she can do this three-year program. So I got in, I graduated in 81 and had lots and lots of friends who are now so wealthy, so popular. You know a lot of their names. Um, and that is exactly what they wanted to do. They wanted to be stars or they wanted to be, you know, not acknowledged for their talents and some just wanted to act and they were fortunate enough to get a tv series or big movies or you know things like that but anyway i i have nothing to complain about i i i acted for 40 years i retired in 2015 and uh i came here to Faribault because this is where my husband grew up and he wanted to move back here when he retired. So we didn't move when he retired, but we did get it all together when I did. So here we are. It's, you know, when I first moved here, I, I lived most of my life in New York City, <laughs> which was well, at least 20 some years of it in New York City. And I thought that that was the only place any you know, cogent human being can live. But I'm so grateful I do not live there. Uh, when I did leave, it felt like I was being, it was August day and it felt like the asphalt was swallowing me up. And anyway, I've worked at the, um, out in Oregon at the Shakespeare Theater out there for a few years. And 
um, ACT. Uh, I did the gospel at Colonus for seven years all over the world and whatever. But there are some quotes that I just wanted to share with you all. Oh, uh, I'm happy here. I have a daughter who's 43. She's my bonus child. When I married my husband, I got her. Now I have two grandchildren. Uh, one is 13. She's right over my shoulder here. And the other one, the little monkey on the corner there, is four. Anyway, um, so I, I am grateful to be here and grateful to have had the life that I have had, and I hope I have a whole lot more life. Um, Bishop Sheen said, there are three rules of dealing with all those who come to us. One is kindness, two is kindness, three is kindness. Martin Luther King Jr. said, courage is an inner resolution to go forward. Cowardice is submission, surren surrender to circumstances. Courage breeds creativity. Cowardice represses fear and is mastered by it. And the last one is from Thich Nhat Hanh, who said, smile, breathe and go slowly. And this is from Isabel O'Connor. But by all means, go forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was lovely. All right. Um, we are having a, a little bit of technical difficulties with our next uh, person. Um, so I apologize, um, of course. That's what happens when we're doing this uh, online. Um, so um, I'm going to, uh, our, our next person is from one of our sponsors, Faribault Foods. So we'll keep an eye out and hopefully he will be able to join us shortly. Um, otherwise, um, I will introduce, um, so, uh, sorry, we're trying to get him in, but, um, otherwise I will go ahead and introduce, um, our next speaker, um, our mayor, Mayor Kevin Varachek is a Faribault native who, in addition to serving as the city of Faribault, um, he owns a small business and he volunteers his time to several community organizations, including the Boy Scouts, the Knights of Columbus, the Blue Collar Festival, the Economic Development Authority, and several other city boards and commissions. So, um, Mayor Kevin Vracek. Thank you for that. Good morning and welcome to the MLK Breakfast. Thank you to the Diversity Coalition for this tradition now in its eighth year, and thank you to this year's sponsors. I am Mayor Kevin Brachik, and I am honored to be part of this celebration. This is not my farewell, or the good old boy's farewell, or the way it was back in my day farewell. It is our farewell. I don't think that anyone hasn't noticed that our farewell is full of diversity. Mr. King would be proud of our farewell and the changes that have been made over the years with the way we are growing as a community. Let's find ways to continue doing better in embracing the growth and diversity that is to come. A quote by Kofi Annan says, we may have different religions, different languages, different colored skin, but we all belong to one human race. We all share the same basic values. We are the same human beings, and that is what binds us together. There are bits of ethnicity all over Faribault. We have a variety of shops and restaurants owned by people of multiple different colors, race, and creed. From the three original Catholic churches for the different immigrants groups to town, and now one united Catholic church. Various Lutheran churches, e-free churches, a mosque, and a multitude of other options. We have restaurants of assorted flavors, American fair, Mexican, Somalian, and Asian, with lots of variations within each style. Each of these represents us, 
our furrow. We must be proud of our furrow and ask, how can I make our furrow better? MLK Day is a day of service, and I ask you to serve our furrow. I don't ask you to serve just our furrow today, but every day. We must stand up for our furrow. I encourage you to stop being a bystander and to be a progressive. Don't just sit back and wish things were better. Take action and do something. Martin Luther King Jr. shared his dream for what the world should be like. His dream was to have a fair, peaceful world where everyone is equal to one another. What would your dream world look like? 2022 marks the 150th year of Fairwell's Corporation. This means for 150 years and more, our Fairwell has been accepting people from all over to help form this town. There will be expanded emphasis on this year's Heritage Day celebration to talk about where we have been and where we are now and where we want and we are here to write its future. Do you want our Fairwell to be a better place for you, for your kids, for the generations after them? We're all part of this community and we must support it to keep it vibrant. Our Fairwell wasn't built on people staying in their houses and keeping to themselves. It was built by people meeting in Central Park, downtown shops, churches, and theaters, having conversations. It was built by people taking responsibility and making positive changes. For 150 years, they've been gathering together to help build our fair boat. So I ask you to venture out to say hi, to volunteer at a local organization, to have a cup of coffee with someone. You never know how these small actions can make an impact. Our Fairbow has had 150 years of challenges, conflicts, growth, and celebrations, and I look forward to being a part of the growth and celebrations of the future of Fairbow. Thank you. Thank you so much. I didn't know that, that Fairbow was incorporated 150 years ago. That's going to be quite the festivities this summer. I hope Very so. Very awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um, all right, um, we're, still, <laughs> we're still having technical difficulties. It could not have gone smoothly. If this had gone smoothly, I would have been surprised. So um, we are still trying to work on that. Um, meanwhile, um, I would like to share that last year when we decided to host our breakfast online, our program manager at the time, Peter Van Sluis, gathered forces and put together this amazing video of Dr. King's speech. And um, you'll, you'll notice that he gathered together uh, the youth from uh, lots of different schools. And um, please join me as we watch this video. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous degree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro is still not free. 100 years later, that life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. 100 years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself an exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall here. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men, as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note, insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. 
but we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insignificant funds in the great wealth of this nation. And so we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of this future and you see of now. This is no time to engage in luxury of cooling off or to take tranquilizing drug of granulism. Now is the time to make real promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to sunlit path of racial injustice. Now is the time to lift nations from the quicksand of racial injustice to solid rock of his brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the movement. The sweltering summer of the Negro's legitimate discontent will not pass until there's an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. And those who hope that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will not be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. And there will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundation of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. But there is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst of freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protest to degenerate into physical violence. And again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force with soul force. The marvelous new militancy which has engulfed the Negro community must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brothers, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied to our destiny. And they have come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we will always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by sign stating, for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied. And we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I am not unmindful. Some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from the narrow jail cells, and some of you have come from areas where you quest and quest for freedom left battered by the storms of persecution to strangled by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veneers of created suffering, continuing to work with faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia. Go back to Louisiana. Go back to the slums of the ghetto of the northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, and so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream 
that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day, down in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day, right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day, every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope, and this is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out a mountain of despair, a stone of hope, with this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day. This will be the day when God's children will be able to sing with new meaning. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And so, let freedom ring from the most prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the gracious slopes of California. But not only that. Let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and molehill of Mississippi. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. And when this happens, and when we allow freedom ring, we will let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city. We will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Oh, I just get teary-eyed when I see that. Thank you so much, Peter. Awesome. Thank you. Um, all right. So uh, we were able to get in our, um, our representative from Faribault Foods, Juan Aguirre, Senior HR Generalist with Faribault Foods. Uh, would you like to introduce your company? Juan, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, uh, let me start my video. Oh, sure. There you are. Hi. Yes. Hi, how are you? Good. Yeah, Good. and now that I've been, been uh, emailing you, it's nice to see your face. So yes. welcome. We're happy to Go be ahead. here. The floor is yours. And uh, we already had um, uh, Isabel go. So you just uh, introduce your company and then we'll go from there. So thanks so much for joining us. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, uh, 
we're, as you know, Faribault Foods has been in, the, in Faribault for a long time, since 1895. And we're very really happy to be part of the community and also to uh, work in any way we can uh, locally and, uh, and around to help all those in need. We collaborate in many ways to support nonprofits in other uh, areas. And obviously right now we're uh, emphasizing on our recruitment efforts to make sure that uh, we increase our team uh, and invite more people over. Uh, we're dedicated to working with local farmers as well. And as much as possible, we uh, support the local economy and in ways that, that promote jobs locally in many ways. Uh, and we're happy to be here. Uh, our diverse uh, team of employment or employees, we have over 400 people here and they come from all different types of background. So we're really grateful for this opportunity to introduce ourselves and during the Martin Luther King breakfast uh, and listening to the I Have a Dream speech, uh, very moving as well. So thank you and we're happy to be here. Thank you so much, appreciate it. All right. Um... Let's see. Thank you uh, again. Thank you so much, Juan. I appreciate it. Or JC, uh, it was so nice to, to meet you. I've been emailing so many people that it's, I, I know that we're online and we're not actually person to person, um, but this is the next best thing. And, and um, I'm a people person. I'm an extrovert. So uh, this, is, this is really, really nice to finally see uh, people and to, um, to, to talk to them. So thank you again for joining us. Really appreciate it. And I didn't realize that with, uh, with Faribault Foods, which is kind of a, like a no duh. Um, one of my husband's friends, Jeff Anderson works for Faribault Foods. And so it's, um, it's nice to know that, that you all are working with local farmers. So that's great. So they, I'm learning so much today and I've been in Faribault for 19, I was in Faribault for 19 years. So thank you again. All right. Um, another one of our sponsors is uh, XL Energy, and the representative could not be here today, but I wanted to share on their website, um, XL has had the privilege of serving customers and operating in hundreds of communities across its eight state service territory, and that success is uniquely tied to the success of those we serve. Uh, in addition, XL Energy success is not simply a measure of profit, but equally as a broader impact on the public good. And I believe that Dr. King would like that um, in terms of the public good. So thank you again to XL Energy for sponsoring our, um, our event this morning. Um, our next speaker is uh, Joseph L. Bele. He's a Tanzanian professor, and he's at the English department at St. Olaf College. He previously taught at the literature department at the University of Dar es Salaam, and that's actually where he is right now for the J term. He's in Tanzania. He previously, or he's a cultural consultant, helping Africans and Americans navigate cultural differences, even in Faribault, where he served on the board of the Faribault Diversity Coalition and participated in the International Festival and other events. His book, Africans and Americans Embracing Cultural Differences, is widely read, and he's just published a sequel, Chickens in the Bus, More Thoughts on Cultural Differences. Hello, my name is uh, Joseph Mbele. I'm a Tanzanian. I teach at Central Olaf College in Northfield, in Minnesota, um, in the English department. Uh, right now, I'm speaking from Dar es Salaam uh, in my country, Tanzania. And um, I'm happy to share a word or two um, on this uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, ce celebration. Um, it's uh, January 16, 2022. Um, like many people, uh, maybe like most people, I'm a great admirer of Martin Luther King Jr. And um, I just want to highlight two points from his uh, message, from his legacy. Um, the first point is um, um, his belief in human equality. Uh, when he said he dreamt of the time when his nation uh, would be a place where his children would be able to be judged 
uh, on the on the basis of their character, uh, not on the basis of the color of their skin. He was underlining this message of human equality. Um, and I want to invite us to think about it a bit more. Uh, judging people on the basis of their character, uh, are we actually doing it? Um, um, and Martin Luther King Jr. was speaking not to just one group of people, not to one nation, uh, but to all human beings. So in other words, if you are what uh, you might say, you know, a person of color, um, remember you do not have um, um, any special qualities because of the color of your skin. Uh, you are not immune to uh, evil deeds or intentions. Uh, you are not automatically good. And if somebody else is a different color, say what they call white, it's the same thing. Uh, they have the potential to be good as well as to be bad. I have the potential to be good and also the potential to be bad. Uh, I think that's one of the interpretations of what Martin Luther King Jr. had in mind. So the task is for all of us to strive to be good people. We shouldn't assume simply because I'm black, I'm a good person. I have to struggle against my, um, my, my bad inclinations. I have to struggle to improve myself. Um, when Muslims talk about jihad, the fundamental meaning is this of struggling against your negative tendencies struggling to make yourself better it's a lifelong struggle so it's a jihad um, to achieve the dream that martin luther king jr had in mind where we really really need to pose and uh, not make judgments about people uh, before we have understood what they do what they say and all that so what people do should be the criterion for determining whether they are good or bad. The second point that um, I want to uh, highlight here is that Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, took the whole human race as a family. Uh, he took the whole human race as a family. He considered it a family, um, one body. So when he said uh, uh, injustice anywhere in the world, is a threat to justice everywhere. Uh, that's something to really think about. So those of us who are in the USA might be, you know, very keen on talking about injustices in the USA, and we have to, uh, but also, you know, some of us came from other parts of the world where there's tremendous injustice also, maybe, and um, we need to focus on those uh, places as well um, because injustice in those other countries is a threat to justice everywhere else that's the meaning of uh, Martin Luther King Jr's uh, statement it's one body it should all be well you know there should be no part of the world suffering if we could develop this kind of consciousness of fighting a global battle to make the whole world a good place, um, then we will have um, heeded the message of Martin Luther King Jr. So anyway, um, I think for today, because I've just a very short time to talk, um, I will stop here and um, I wish everybody a very nice day. Let's strive to achieve Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream. Um, next, I would like to introduce John Harper. I believe I saw John, um, and he is the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and he's at South Central College, another one of our sponsors. John, did I see you? Yes, there he is. Thank you for joining us this morning. I appreciate it. Uh, you have the floor. 
Good morning. It is a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, as Lisa so eloquently put, I am the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at South Central College. I've been with the college for um, almost five, yeah, it's about five and a half years now, and I've, um, I'm grateful and thankful. I've spent a lot of time in the Faribault community, and I can say without question, it's a vibrant community. It's a bright community. It's been a joy and a pleasure to connect with all the different diverse uh, individuals, the different ethnicities and the culture, and to continue to support the Faribault community in any way possible. Um, with that being said, thank you all for um, allowing South Central to be a sponsor, uh, not just for this event, but for a lot of the things that the Faribault community is doing. And so from here, Lisa, am I good to go to introduce our next speaker? You can. It's all you. Uh, fantastic. Um, it gives me great pride and joy to introduce to you all the next speaker, uh, Dr. Naren Brown. Dr. Brown currently serves as Vice President of Research and Institutional Effectiveness and the Dean of our Faribault campus here at South Central College. He also serves as the co-lead for the Minnesota State System Enrollment Affinity Group. He is the Chair of the Faribault Housing and Redevelopment Authority and member of the Faribault Ch Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors and the Faribault Main Street Board of Directors. Uh, he has also formally served as the chair of the Higher Education Data Sharing Consortium. Dr. Brown received the Iowa's governor's seal of approval for the creation of a coding camp designed to increase diversity <clears throat> with computer science. Um, and he presents regularly. He has co-authored several books and multiple chapters and serves as the lead editor for in uh, serves as the lead editor for issues of new directions for institutional research. I can tell you all without question, it has not only been a joy for me to work with Dr. Naren Brown, but what you're about to hear from him is not only important, it's impactful. Uh, he is a great father, he is a, a trusted colleague, and it is an honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Naren Brown to you all today. Thank you, John, uh, for that um, lovely introduction. Uh, very, very kind of you. Um, can every? I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Can everyone hear me by a show of hands? You know, making sure that. Yes, you know. we can hear you. You are host now too, Dr. Brown. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> um, the title of this talk today and I was told I had 15 minutes I'm gonna try to stay within 15 minutes um Lisa feel free to cut me off if I go too long okay um, <laughs> <You're good. laughs> the the title of this talk um started with a research question but the title is if the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. were alive today and it kind of this topic kind of started off as 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 as, uh, as a um logic thought process or like a, a brain tweezer brain teaser type research question that started off something like would reverend would the reverend dr martin luther king jr support black lives matter now i'm a phd and so i like to set up things in research questions and hypotheses and so the null hypothesis would be that no he wouldn't and the um, hypothesis that you would be trying to find support for um, or disprove would be uh, that he would, right? But I want to share a little bit of background about me and then make some things clear. Um, one, these are my thoughts. They're, they're not representative of South Central College where I work. Um, these are my thoughts on, on the topic um, that I felt were germane uh, for today's conversation. My grandma was born in 1931. My dad was born in 1937, and my mom was born in 1947. That means that respectfully, respectively, they were 34, 28, and 17 when they became full citizens of the United States, thanks to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. I was born in 1973, so I'm 48 years old. I even spoke to my mother, who's still alive, prior to finishing this talk, and um, she tended to agree with some of the conclusions I come to. By the record, and for the for the record, in 2013, the Voting Rights Act was gutted by SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of the United States. And in one between January 1st of 2020 and 
uh, September 27 19, of 2020, 19 states en enacted 33 laws that make it harder to vote. A mere seven years later. We just heard a lovely reading of Dr. King's speech, his most famous speech, I Have a Dream speech. And this is um, straight from uh, the University of Minnesota Human Rights Library. The link is in the title of the slide. So you can go and read this transcript. But I took two, two, tra two, 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 tra um, two quotes out of that speech that I think go overlooked. Um, now we all know um, Martin Luther King was assassinated on April 4th, 1968, but he gave this speech five years earlier on, April, on August 28th of 1963. He says, there will, neither, there will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until that bright day of justice emerges. Now, set that in the backdrop of, uh, backdrop of what we know has been happening in our world today with um, ever-increasing voter restrict, restricted voting laws and uh, a pandemic of police brutality. Two paragraphs later, King goes about defining the justice that was necessary. He says, and as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? And of the first, I mean, the very first definition, right, requirement for rest and tranquility, he mentions, is we can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of unspeakable horrors of police brutality. This is 1963, right? If you listen to um, black music from our earliest recordings in the late 1800s when you're getting um, Delta blues musicians on, on wax printed records, you hear songs of police brutality. Marvin Gaye, you bring it to today, modern rappers, NWA was big in my, my youth, right? You see the, the history of something that's been taking place in this country um, put, on, put forward on mu as music as a form of record keeping, right? So here's a brief history of policing and police brutality in America. In 1704, you have the beginning of the slave patrols in South Carolina. Sounds it's straightforward. These were folks who were empowered to go um, hunt down and, and collect escaped slaves. Okay. In 1838, you have your first police departments forming. Now, between 1828 and 1968, there's a lack of law enforcement and government intervention during the lynchings and during lynchings and murders, where it is estimated over 5,000 folks were, uh, uh, black folks were lynched um, and, and murdered with no, with no support from law enforcement or the federal government. That first police department that forms in 1838, by the way, uh, was in the North and initially targeted new white immigrants. But as black folks started to move north to escape, uh, escaping slavery and then Jim Crow, it quickly transitioned to targeting them. In 1865, Southern states established the first black codes. And these were things like, um, uh, this is where jaywalking comes from. This is, this is where today you see what we call Karens walking up to folks, asking them if they have a permit to barbecue because it gave the power to white folks to stop and question black folks during their normal course of the day. 1865 is also when the KKK is formed. 1877, protesters and law enforcement clash in the Great Railroad Strike. 
Um, this is really one of those lesser known places where uh, workers from real world, both black and white, uh, were um, protesting and law enforcement uh, killed several hundred of them. 1956, Cointel Pro. Cointel Pro was ran by J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, and it actively um, infiltrated and tried to destabilize both the Black Power Movement and the Civil Rights Movement. So both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. And I find it difficult to talk about King without talking about X. Um, so, but Cointel Pro was sanctioned by the U.S. government. Right. This is the FBI. 1967, um, the federal uh, federal Kerner Commission admits that white racism. And you can, there's a links in all these slides and you can have the slides um, admits that white racism and police brutality is the cause of urban rebellions of the 1960s. These findings were the result of Lyndon B. Johnson's organizing the National Advisory Committee on Civil, Civil Disorders to investigate the cause of recent major riots. One of the things that's really important to note here is LBJ was a conservative. He didn't eagerly accept these findings, like he wasn't happy to read them, but his own commission, this is what they found. It's 1967. June 18, 1971, the war on drugs began. Um, a former Nixon era domestic policy chief, uh, John er Ehrlichman, you, here's a link to, later confirmed that the effort was designed to hurt black families. Think about that. This is 1971. I'm not born yet. I'm two years from being born. But the war on drugs was designed to hurt black families. 1970s to the 1980s, you have the rise of broken window policing, which stated that small crimes would lead to bigger crimes if not punished. Police took licenses, licenses to enforce punishments on small offenses like jaywalking or unauthorized barbecues. In 1994, the violent crime bill, Clinton administration, three strikes provisions paved the way for mass incarceration. An entire portion of this bill highlighted tough punishments like the bill's three strikes rule which implemented life sentences for people who had already had two other offenses under their belt. Now, what's crazy is that incarceration, incarceration works weirdly because in Faribault, we have a jail. If you are incarcerated in that Faribault jail, in the census count, you are counted as a citizen of Faribault. You're counted in that head count in the city where you're housed, which takes federal dollars from the city where you came from and puts it in a city that is incarcerating you, that doesn't represent you demographically or may not represent you demographically, right? Uh, definitely may not represent you culturally. And it's taking federal money from a community that could probably use it more than the community it's being given to. That has impacts on quality of schooling, supplies at school, building up K, all of your social infrastructures, that one, one accounting trick negatively impacts one column and positively impacts another. In 1997, the 1033 program, um, again, link to it right there, a military equipment loan program, a military equipment loan program that incorporated military weapons like grenade launchers in police departments in almost every state in the union. This, as you, if you have the weapon, if you have the tool, now you want to use the tool, as you might think, it further heightened the use of military assault rifles during public calls to action, such as protests or riots. And King went on record saying that a riot is the voice of the unheard. That's also a quote that I think King doesn't get attributed to enough. We hear the, we, we hear the I have a dream and let freedom ring. And um, when black men and white men, we hear the ideals, right, that he espoused, which were brilliant ideals, but we don't hear the reasons he gave for espousing those ideals a lot, right? It's easy to say King was nonviolent and King wanted us all to be equal. But what he was saying about wanting us all to be equal was, hey, there's a group, Black men, the Negro, who's not equal, right? We, we forget, I think, as a, as a country, we're good at forgetting the reasons why someone was an activist. 
In 2000, the prison population almost doubled from a single decade. Start with the war on drugs, 1970 broken windows policy, 1994 violent crime bills hits, 2000, our prison population almost doubles. Department of, Just Department of Justice statistics show that about 1.39 million people were incarcerated in the year 2000, as opposed to 774,000 in 1990. By 2018, Black men were more than five times more likely to be imprisoned than white men, and Black women were imprisoned 1.8 times more than white women. Now, in America today, we'll hear that there is a Black-on-Black -black crime problem, like there's some type of pathology there, right? The reality is, is if you look at the statistics, something like 87% of crimes in the Black community are quote-unquote Black-on-Black, and something like 82% of crimes in the white community are quote-unquote white-on-white. However, there is no pathology associated with the white on white crime. And these statistics, they're consistent over time. It makes me think, well, wow, why is there a pathology associated with people of my color, but not people of the, the majority color, right? If you're saying that crime is this or that, violent crime is this or that, or most crime in the black community is black on black, well, most crime in the white community is white on white. There's no pathology associated with it though, right? In November 28, 2014, the UN Committee Against Torture, the UN Committee Against Torture, condemns police brutality and excessive use of force by law enforcement in the US and called for action against police brutality in the BIPOC communities and an effort to decrease the killing of unarmed BIPOC people. 2017 to 2020, the Trump administration, he starts to peel back department programs that were designed to investigate local police departments for racism and excessive force. These things were, it, these, 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 uh, these investigate, these, these, uh, the policies he's peeling back were implemented during the Obama administration, um, where Obama started to issue police reform programs that were underway to find solutions to racial tension involving law enforcement. Now, think about this. It was Obama who instituted something to start finding, to figure out a way to address racial tension, but it was, it was in 1967 when we identified that it was a racial tension causing the problems, right? And it wasn't racial tension from the people of color, it was racial tension from the police, right? White, white racism and police brutality. So 30 some years later, 40 some years later, finally a president is doing something about something that other president found. And I, and I don't want to get segue here too much, but this is a question I've heard a lot as a black man um, about, I've been asked this often, well, did Obama make race relations worse in America? And I, I, I'm always kind of dumbfounded by that question. Like, oh, so one, one, one black man made um, race relations worse in America because he was president for eight years? Like, like we didn't, we, we don't have a history, like we don't have a, like a violent history where um, our framers even owned slaves. And I, I, I don't, the question when I hear it is, is so insensitive that it's hard for me to respond in a coherent way. I just kind of usually look at people like they're stupid. Um, but think about that, you know, as, as you move forward in your day. So where this started with this mental exercise of would King support um, Black Lives Matter today? It led to these other questions. It seems to me that America reveres the reverend and not the doctor. He was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. I've been very purposeful about putting his title throughout the slide deck correctly. Right? He had a PhD. He was a studied man, read Mahatma Gandhi, highly influenced by Mahatma Gandhi, um, well-read. Um, PhD is hard to get. You have to produce the, uh, the rules of P get, attaining a PhD haven't changed. You have to add to the body of knowledge to obtain them. 
Then it led to another question. Why are most photos of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. black and white when color photography was commonplace during the civil rights era? I ask you to, to, to ponder those questions with me as you listen to the rest of my talk. So I'm gonna use a term here I haven't brought up yet. And I usually, I, for the record, I identify as black. That's me. But I understand that I'm a part of the diasporic African-American community. And by diasporic, I mean all of those groups, all of those groups, uh, all, all of those Africans who were taken from the majority of the West Coast of Africa in chains and sold or shipped to the Americas or other or to South to the Americas or, or other or, or, or Europe, right? That's the diaspora. Matter of fact, Africa refers to that. The continent of Africa now calls that the sixth region, right? But the civil rights movement at its heart, at its height in the 60s, drew children, teenagers, and young adults into a maelstrom of marches, violence, and in some cases, imprisonment. The student, here's, here's, here's just four examples of, of how chill, young youth played a role in the Civil Rights Movement. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, formed in 1960. April 16th to April 18th, there was actually a little conference, and formed in 1960, instrumental in the Freedom Rides from 1961. The Little Rock Nine, 1957. This is the Central High School integration where nine students of color, um, I'm gonna admit somebody here, nine students of color were being integrated into a high central high school, an all white high school. The lunch counter sitting at Woolsworth in Greensboro, North Carolina, February 1st, 1960, the Greensboro Four. And then the youth of Birmingham who, who marched for justice in 63, we've all seen these videos. This is called the Children's Crusade. We all see the videos of the, we've all seen the videos of the dogs and the fire hoses and the police with nice sticks, beating folks who only wanted to vote, wanted to be, um, wanted to cash the check that our architects um, wrote. Let's, let's fast forward now. This is what today's diasporic African American and youth less social moments look like. And I, I must say, this, this title is a little misleading. This is not just diasporic African American youth, this is all youth. Um, this is George Floyd's, um, George Floyd's death. We all know, we all saw it. Sparked more than 550 protests, rallies, and vigils across this country. However, the death of that man in police custody sparked protests in at least 40 countries, represented every continent except Antarctica. So what, is, what, do, what do these youth-led movements look like today? They look like teens take charge. They look like March for Our Lives, which some of you know me, March for Our Lives is, 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 is um, a very, they're advocating for, for, for some pretty serious restrictions on firearms. Black Lives Matter. We all know Black Lives Matter, and Black Lives Matter will say and has said repeatedly they don't advocate violence. Um, they actually tell you when they're in a space, and there's other things, there's other folks that no one can control who, who might want to spark violence. Um, Greta Thunberg, um, who the climate, the climate, <clears throat> the climate uh, change activist. I find her a very exciting young person to watch. Um, actually, I, exci I find most of these folks, most of these groups exciting to watch because they have a voice. They have a lot in common with the youth of the civil rights movement. They have a voice and they know how to use it. They understand marketing, right? Whether it be internet or using the media, the, the Children's Crusade used the media, the traditional media to get their message out, right? That's what helped turn the tide of the civil rights 
movement was when folks started seeing the videos of the dogs and the police and the billy clubs. They want change, right? These groups have a lot in common with the youth groups of the civil rights movement. In 2015, BLM issued a statement outlining its 15, excuse me, its, its, policing, its, poli its policing goals that it wanted to see as far as policy changes go. They wanted to end broken windows policing. They wanted community oversight for misconduct rather than to have police decide what consequences officers face. They wanted to make standards for reporting police use of deadly force. They wanted to independently investigate and prosecute police misconduct. They wanted police departments to have racial makeups that reflect its community, the communities they serve. They wanted to require officers to wear body cameras. They wanted to provide training for police officers. They wanted to end for-profit policing practices. They wanted to end the police use of military equipment. They wanted to um, change the union contracts so that officers would be held accountable for misconduct. When I, when I first read these back in, in 2015, I was like, oh, that doesn't seem radical. Seems to make common sense, right? Some of it's difficult to do. All seem kind of necessary. When I think about it, if these were adopted nationwide, lots, and I do mean lots of people of color and not and, and people who aren't of color. Right? Lots of American citizens wouldn't have lives at the hands of police, or a lot less would have. And I think King would point that out. I mean, he pointed it out in 1963. I mean, I think he would be continually pointing it out. He would continue to advocate for poor people as he started to right before his death. And he would continue to say that the money that we use in Iraq or the money that we use in Vietnam, which he did say the money we use in Vietnam could be better used to help the poor people within our own country, right? That we shouldn't be fighting these unjust wars. I think he would continue to point out that police brutality plagues black people in poor communities or BIPOC communities and black people uh, disproportionately. And I don't think he would sit silent. I think he would support these goals. These are my thoughts. This is my perspective on it. This is not the colleges, but um, I, I encourage uh, anyone to, to challenge me on this. If you see me walking through the community one day, if you disagree. So to answer the question, why does America revere the Reverend and not the doctor? I go to one of my favorite rappers of all time. He's also one of the oldest rappers because he's like one of the, the original generation when, when, when I'm going to hate on some young folks when rap was rap. It's because I believe Dr. King would have asked questions just like Harris one here. Go back to all. Can you hear the video? Yes. Okay. Those black and white films where you saw the Klan marching on Washington. Thousands of white men in hooded robes marching. Where are all those robes today? So they burned them all. This is what baffles me about American society. Who cleans these robes? This is, these robes are not machine washable. They got patches and stuff on them. You got to take it to the cleaners. Who's, who's upgrading and mending, sewing, and keeping all those robes in material existence to this day? Who's doing that work? 
<laughs> Who's doing? Where the robes go? Why you can't get one on auction? Why you don't see one at the Salvation Army? Thrift shop, clan robe, a thrift shop. Somebody turned it in. Why you don't see that? Because people are still holding on to them. They even still wearing them. Maybe not outside, but somewhere it's still getting worn. Now I can tell you where all the Black Panther outfits are. They got holes in them <laughs> with red liquid all over them. I can tell you where the guns went. The cops took them after they shot this guy. In the, come on. Fred Hampton, I can tell you where his guns went. We know what happened to our movements. What happened to that other one? To close, I'm going to leave you with, with a quote. Um, I studied political science through my master's degree and then got my PhD in educational leadership and policy studies. Um, so I, I like to, to wrap up talks with, with constitutional references whenever possible um, or theory on the architects, the, the framers. When the architects of our republic, and this is an Ip King quote, by the way, when the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. The note was a promise that all men, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note in so far as our citizens of color are concerned. He wrote these words in 1963. He spoke them at the very speech that we had students speak today. And I, I argue, I posit that they are still true in 2021. Thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I will stop sharing my video now. Well, thank you so much for that. That was insightful. Thank you. I appreciate you. that. Appreciate the invitation to speak. Thank you. And, uh, and you are at South Central. So if anybody has a question, they can contact you. Yes. Okay. I'll put, I'll, yeah, yes. I'll put my personal email in the chat. Oh, great. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so if you can switch over uh, and give back the hosting to Peter, um, we are going to shift to our closing. All right. And then, Peter, if you could um, pin me again um, or spotlight me or whatever it is. Um, before I introduce the singer, to end our event, I'd like to thank you all for joining us um, this, this morning. Um, we would like to thank the speakers, our keynote, Dr. Naren Brown, our guests, and um, our sponsors, Faribault Foods, Jenny Yo, XL Energy, and again, South Central College. If you're interested in the Faribault Diversity Coalition's mission and vision, please contact us. We are currently looking for new board members and volunteers. We also have a book club that meets the third Thursday of every month. Um, our next meeting is actually this Thursday. Uh, check out our Facebook page for more information. If you're interested in a t-shirt, um, we do have these for $15. Very nice. And we are also selling our tumblers. They keep your, um, your drink warm um, most of the day. That's for $30. Please let us know. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce um, Tiffany Ogunsami, a student at Shattuck St. Mary's.
All right, thank you again, everyone. And please remember Reverend Dr. King's dream of freedom, equality, justice, and love. Have a great rest of your day.